Chapter two explores the um, developmental theories, the most prominent developmental theories uh, within uh, this field. So uh, we'll look at these a little bit more in depth. So what's a theory? A theory is an explanation that's that a scientist has formulated based on their observation, reading, um, and hopefully just not their belief, but an, an explanation. It, it does suggest the what, how, or why of certain phenomena in developmental context uh, looks specifically at how we change over time. Jean Piaget, who is one of the theories we're gonna explore, was specifically interested in cognitive development. So he looked at the what, how, and why of cognitive development over time. Freud was more interested in psychological development. So his concentration was on what, why, how, or why of psychological development over time. These theories are great guideline for research. So uh, Freud came up with his theory. It is the researcher's job to go behind and, and formulate um, a research designed to see whether the uh, theory was supported or refuted by their results. So theories are not facts. They're just general explanations, some with more support than others, about how we develop over time. Um, so a theory is, again, explanation. Someone comes with an explanation. For example, uh, for Eric Erickson, his uh, theory was that the first year of life, the big conflict is for the child to develop a sense of trust or mistrust by whatever the environment uh, whatever is requirement it required for the from the environment so if someone was going to go back and design a study they would look at that theory they would formulate a hypothesis based on Erickson's uh, first stage and they would say if a child is provided with support and love and consistency during the first year of life they will establish a sense of trust so that's the hypothesis then you would put a design together uh, to test that hypothesis. And you can see the challenges right there and there with how do we study this? How do we scientifically, uh, how can we study this scientifically? But the research design is put together. Um, the, the researcher will put together a design, recruit the subjects, look at trust versus mistrust, and from based on their observation and results, will either support the theory, modify it, or refute it altogether. So that's how usually um, research designs are put together. Some of the things to consider, and again, this is kind of a repetition from cha uh, chapter one, but it's important to really consider as we look at these um, theories and developmental milestones. How much of who you are is due to your nature versus nurture. So nature is your biological um, genetic predisposition and how much of it is due to nurture. When we look at something like intelligence, are you born or is one born as an Einstein and they're, uh, they naturally are, are like that biologically or uh, are they born, everyone born the same and their environment nurture creates that Einstein. And again, just like we talked about the, the last chapter, we're somewhere in between. We believe the belief in this field is that you are born with certain propensities. For example, Einstein was born with propensity for being highly intelligent and because of his environmental stimulation, that gene was nourished and thus we got Einstein. Uh, in terms of progression of development, is it continuous or does it happen in stages? We'll look at that. Are you active or passive recipient of uh, our environmental factors? Some of the early roots of um, developmental psychology. I'm going to go a little bit step before John Locke. In medieval times, children were seen as evil uh, creatures that had the, the evilness, the devil had to be beat out of them. So a lot of physical punishment, a lot of um, punitive uh, discipline, kind of disciplining, um, and the age of reason 
when you can expect a child to act as an adult and make good decision was seven years old. Thank God things have changed since then. John Locke was one of the people that came and talked about Tibola Rasa, blank slate. He believed that you are absolutely born with no nature. There's no evilness. You are born as a blank slate. And it is nurture, these experiences and learning from one's environment that shapes the child into who they are. That knowledge comes from that. Jean-Jacques Rousseau came and said, we do have these innate processes, hard nature, that um, as we progress through infancy, childhood, and adolescence, the environment will either uh, lower or increase those innate processes, and that ultimately shapes who you are. So he went a little bit in between. Uh, Charles Darwin, who came up with theory of evolution, which I'm sure you all heard about, it's important in psychology um, for example, when we talk about physical development, which, which of our physical um, features are important in helping us survive our environment? Well, other theories have gone a step further and have looked at our cognitive or social emotional development in terms of helping us survive our environment. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit further. You want to make sure you know G. Stanley Hall, who is considered the father of uh, developmental psychology or child development. His interest was um, whether uh, children develop in a certain way. So he established this scientific journal and he published child development research that was done uh, in the time. And he also is accredited with being the first president of APA, which is American Psychological Association. Um, a huge association for psychologists to come together and share, share research and talk back and forth. Um, you also have James uh, Mark Baldwin, who conducted these quantitative and experimental research on infant development, which is really important in increasing our interest in infants and uh, some of these infant um, milestones. But the guru of all this is actually of, of theories, especially with psychosocial uh, stages, uh, is uh, Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud grew up in Austria and uh, due to World War II was, had to uh, go to, and the Nazis had to flee to England. Um, he was the first theorist to come up with stages of psychological development. And he called his stages psychosexual theory of development. Um, he um, treated a bunch of uh, women who came to him because of uh, different uh, neurological, not neurological, I'm sorry, neurosis uh, disorders. He talked about hysteria, the role of trauma in creating these abnormalities and his big thing was talking cure. He was the first one to promote talking as a form of therapeutic technique. Uh, in his theory, he emphasized early childhood. So he believed whatever happens in early childhood, we're talking from zero to about five, six, seven, it shapes who you are. And because of these environmental stressors, the child will learn how to deal deal with these stressors through these defense mechanisms that we'll talk about in a second. Um, the idea, these three structures of personality, which are really important, make sure you know this for the exam as well as just for our class, he believed we have these three structures in our personality that ultimately help us with decision making and just going through life. He called one component the id, is one called ideas id. The id is a part of our personality that runs on the pleasure principle. The id's job is to provide you with pleasure, biological as well as just pure uh, gratification and immediate gratification. Uh, I'm going to jump to superego, which is your moral, uh, when you decide on something and you you are thinking about the right or wrong. It is the super ego that's telling you this is right, this is wrong. And then you have ego, which uh, is uh, based in reality. It is your consciousness. 
and it tries to mediate between it and superego. He also talked about these three levels of consciousness, and you can see most of the stuff that id um, tells you to do or controls your decision making is really in the unconscious. You're not even, you may not be even aware of it. Super ego, part of it is unconscious. These are the right and wrong that society has embedded in us, um, as well as um, things that we're aware of. And the ego tends to be more reality based. Um, you're aware of what you're doing. So let's say, for example, uh, you have a big exam coming on Monday. And obviously, we're talking about pre pre COVID time, but um, or hopefully post COVID time. Um, is Friday, you have three chapters to read and prepare for the exam. Your friend calls you and says, we have an uh, all-day party barbecue on uh, Sunday. Would you be interested in coming? These three, these really, id and superego, each are going to tell you what to do, are going to control your decision-making. And it's the ego's job to help you make a rational, conscientious decision. So id, which is all about pleasure and immediate gratification, will say, oh, just go to the party, damn the consequences. It doesn't care. It just wants, wants, wants. Super ego, which is more right and wrong and moralistic part of one's personality, will say, don't do that. It is wrong. You're going to fail the test. Ego will listen to both and make a decision so that you have fun in your life, but are complying with um, restrictions from society that's put on you. So Freud would say a good, good enough ego will allow you to go to a party maybe for an hour so you experience it and you come back home and study. Individuals who are, um, the, whose decision making and life is uh, controlled by the id, these are individuals who um, are always getting into trouble because they want immediate gratification, damn the consequences. So these um, drug addiction, would be an overdeveloped id, uh, someone that's constantly getting in trouble with the law because they're stealing or um, not really paying attention to uh, societal morals uh, controlled by id. Overeaters, uh, weight, individuals that struggle with weight control, again, id. So overdeveloped id can have its own problems. So can overdeveloped uh, superego. These are individuals that suffer from high anxiety because that voice of um, the morality voice is always telling them you should have done this, but you should have done that. So depression and anxiety is high on, uh, with those and overdeveloped superego, according to Freud. So a job of a parent is to develop a child's ego so that they have fun they, they satisfy the id and at the same time are meeting their moral, um, moral uh, criteria or requirements and um, are, are, not, are not beating themselves up for their decision making. So Freud came up with these really five stages. They're missing the latency. We're going to look at that. Um, however, it is these four that are uh, controversial. Um, Freud said during these four stages, there is a conflict that the child has to uh, overcome. If you get stuck in this conflict, the child will become fixated, right? Uh, each of these will have a certain body parts associated with it where the child is getting, that id is being um, fed. Uh, and this will make sense as we go along a little bit more. If the child gets fixated in any of these stages, as an adult, you will see behaviors uh, where the person is still trying to satisfy that body part. And we'll talk about that in a second. There's a lot of criticism of Freud's psychosexual stages. Um, it is not scientific. Uh, as you, and you'll see it's very difficult to do a scientific research type of um, uh, design on any of these, and other people have come, including Erickson, who have really challenged Freud's uh, concept. So these five stages, make sure you know these for the exam, you need to know the age. Erogenous zone is the part of the body that the child is gaining that pleasure from. It is basically survival for them. 
um, each stage has a major conflict that usually is associated with that erogenous zone. If the child can meet this conflict and resolve it, then with the help of their parent, then the child will move on and no, no major issue. However, if the parent is harsh um, or doesn't allow the child to, to resolve this conflict, then they will be stuck and will show behavior uh, where it indicates an adult fixation of that stage. For example, the first stage is called the oral stage. This is when, from zero to one, and the child erogenous zone, the area that the child is gaining pleasure and really is a lifeline, is the mouth. So the big conflict is taking the child off of the breast or the bottle, depending on uh, which one the child is using. So if the parent is patient and loving during this conflict, the child will uh, graduate and they will have no issues with uh, bottle feeding. If the child is fixated as an adult and as an older person, whenever they get anxious, they go to this area of the body in order to um, deal with that fixation. They're stuck in that stage. So when they get anxious, they overeat, right? So that area of the body that should have been satisfied is not satisfied and the person will eat. When they get angry, they might eat. Uh, smoking. Uh, which again is around the mouth oral area, what we call orally fixated. From one to one, uh, from one to three, sorry, the erogenous zone, the area that uh, holds the conflict is the anus because of toilet training. So that it, uh, the child needs to learn to control their anus whenever they have to defecate, uh, they have to hold it until they can make it to the bathroom. If the parent is too harsh in their toilet training so that the child is con their anus is constantly restricted and uptight, or if the child if the parent is too permissive, whenever you have to go poop, just go poop in the corner, so that the child never learns to hold on uh, to the defecation, that anus has never um, exercised constriction, appropriate constriction then you would have adult fixation. And the adult fixation is really two ranges. Um, what, what he called anal retentive, which is that neatness. Um, think, think of someone uptight, right? The anus is constricted, someone who um, has to have control over all of their, all their surrounding. They're extremely neat and organized to the point of being obsessive. He went out further to say people that are stingy, that can't let go of things, right? Think about constricted anus again. Um, uptight, um, people who are stubborn. It's my idea and I'm not letting it go. These are individuals that are on one spectrum of uh, anal re uh, restrictiveness, that anal uh, adult fixation. On the other hand, people that have never learned to control the anus, have just let go, are messy. These are individuals that are explosive. When I get angry, instead of being able to hold on to my anger, I just kind of explode and uh, become destructive. Again, kind of controversial. The phallic stage is probably the most controversial of the stages. This is between three and six. He said this is when the child's sexual interest begins to arise. It becomes a sexual being. The erogenous zone becomes the genital. And he differentiated what happens for boys versus girls. For boys, they suffered from the Oedipus complex, where the boy falls in love with mom, wants mom all to themselves, and begins to realize at about four or five that um, dad is way bigger than me. And because I want mom to myself, my fantasy is to kill dad and get rid of him. But dad is bigger than me, and he can put me aside, cast me aside, and um, I will be all alone, so the best thing I can do in order to survive Darwin evolution, I am going to reject my mom, my, uh, my emotional tie or my love for my mother, and identify with that. So if you are able to, uh, if the boy is able to resolve this love for their mom, then they will have no adult fixation. For boys that don't, however, they may 
be vain, they may be over ambitious, or they may suffer from what we call mama's boys. These are uh, men who are very attached to their mother. These are men that are looking for a mother replacement in relationships. Um, for girls, he called this the electro complex, where the girl falls in love with dad, wants to get rid of mom, very similar. Uh, in order to, to survive their environment, they will reject their love for their father and will identify with mother. And uh, if they are able to resolve this, no issue. If they're not, then these are the um, uh, daddy's girls. These uh, women, according to Freud, may marry someone older, will become promiscuous, on and on. The latency stage is from 6 to 12. There's no erogenous zone. That ball of energy, that uh, sexual energy is gone now. Uh, there's no major conflict so that the child can concentrate on their academics and peer relationships. There's really no adult fixation here. In the genital stage, which is 12 and up, that sexual energy comes back. However, this is what he called the incest taboo, um, so that the child's sexual interest is now outside of one's family. And the ultimate goal is to... Um, find a partner and um, create one's own family. So just a quick check, uh, which part of personality is based, is best associated with our pleasure, pleasure needs? Yes, I hope you said id, which is all about the uh, pleasure and immediate gratification. According to Freud, why is personality like an iceberg? because most of our psychology is hidden. So if you remember the iceberg, most of the structure is underneath the water, inaccessible to us. So Freud talked about these defense mechanisms and um, in times of anxiety or problem solving or trauma, we depend on these uh, defense mechanism to help us. Um, and for lack of time, I'm gonna uh, you back to your book to really learn more specifically about these defense mechanisms but defense mechanisms are not um, are actually good for dealing with immediate um, problems however if you are um, only solving problems by depending on these defense mechanisms then they can become problematic according to Freud. some of them are more accepted by the culture than others your next theorist is Eric Erickson, uh, who was a student of Freud's work. Um, Eric Erickson uh, came up with uh, his own stages, but he called it psychosocial theory of development. Um, he is really considered the father of developmental psychology because he looked at the entire age span. He went his eight stages cross over uh, from infancy all the way to death, really. I'm not going to go too far into these because as we progress through this class, we will look at each stage. But he um, looked at each stage as having a conflict and depending, again, on how um, the parent deals with uh, this conflict, the child will either have a positive outcome, which is the left side of the conflict, or the uh, right side of the conflict, which is least desirable. And you can see these eight stages, they go all the way to late adulthood. Um, there are absolutely strengths associated with this theory. Uh, and the biggest strength is that it does cover the entire lifespan. The weakness, um, it is a stage or a crisis um, type of model. It is culturally biased and that it really addresses individuals that live in Western cultures. Um, there was, Erickson got a lot of slack for being more um, sensitive to men's development than females, not surprisingly. So there is a gender bias uh, for this theory and very difficult to test. Some of his stages are difficult. The more adult are easier to test, but uh, the younger ages are, again, very difficult to test and um, to provide support for his earlier theories. 
Um, so we're not going to do this learning check because we didn't really go into it. The next major theory that came out was behaviorism, which came out in early 20th century. The folks you want to associate with behaviorism is John B. Uh, Skinner and uh, B. Uh, John Skinner, oh my God, uh, B.F. Skinner, sorry, B.F. Skinner and John Watson, blanking out on names. Uh, the key to understanding development, according to this theory, is observable behavior. Behaviorism was coming out during the same time as Freud's theory. Freud's theory depended on, on, on the unconscious. These folks, especially Watson, uh, said, if you want to make psychology into a credible science, you've got to study behavior. So his emphasis was, how do we uh, shape our behavior and how can we change it? For him, it was all nurture. He went with John Locke, who was a patent of Olorosa. He said, we are born as blank, blank slate. And it's ultimately the external stimuli in the environment that shape who we are. The whole idea of behaviorism and what ultimately B.F. Skinner called classical conditioning uh, was started by Ivan Pavlov, who, uh, and you will read this in your book, talked about these uh, Pavlovian dogs that made associations between external stimuli and certain behaviors. So for Pavlov, he was looking at dog salivation. Um, his interest was actually on how does salivation help us digest over digest our food. So he was collecting saliva from the dogs and he knew anytime you introduce food to the dog, whenever they smell it, their salivation increases. So he called the food unconditioned stimulus, a stimulus in the environment that, that will bring about a certain response, which in this case was a salivation, what he called unconditioned uh, response. What he noticed, however, was whenever at the beginning, whenever the dogs heard footsteps, they began to salivate. And he was kind of puzzled by that. So he started playing around with certain stimuli in the environment. He rang a bell and noticed the dogs did not salivate. However, if you ring the bell and introduce the food, ring the bell and introduce the food, because the food brings about the salivation, the dog will associate the ringing of the bell with ultimately with food, which brings about salivation. So if you pair this enough, the, and now that you ring the bell, the dog will salivate. The whole idea of association was then picked up by John B. Watson, and he applied it to our emotions. He said, we have certain emotions in, uh, we have certain associations with certain emotions with external stimuli. So he did this experiment called Little Albert. Um, I have a video on Little Albert embedded in our module. Please take a look at it. Um, he did this experiment with Little Albert uh, where he showed Little Albert all kinds of stimuli. And Little Albert absolutely showed no emotional reaction. Then he took one of the stimuli, it was a rat, that um, little Albert was interested in and paired it up with a loud noise where he knew the loud noise would startle little Albert and would make him cry. So he introduced the, uh, the rat whenever the, the little Albert went to reach for it, he rang a huge bell and Albert began to cry. With this association, little Albert developed a phobia for white rats because he associated that with something that would jolt him and make him scared. So John B. Watson was one of the first theorists to show that there's association between stimuli in the environment and certain reactions. B.F. Skinner came up with operant conditioning. He said, uh, we can manipulate behavior, not just by association, by what the consequences we give it. And we'll talk about this a little bit further. So that if a behavior is reinforced, uh, is followed up with a pleasant consequence, the behavior is strengthened. So whenever your child makes their bed, you give them a treat, they're more likely to make their bed. That behavior is strengthened. If um, a behavior is punished, which is a negative consequence, that behavior will begin to weaken. 
So whenever a child, uh, let's say, comes home late, you take their PlayStation away, they will, that behavior coming home late, hopefully, will weaken because the consequence is an unpleasant one. Although this seems very basic, it was John, uh, it was B.F. Skinner that helped us understand the consequence of a behavior has a lot to do with wh whether the behavior stays or not. So those of you that are interested in working with um, uh, developmentally challenged uh, children or autistic children, where they're given a behavioral um, schedule or behavioral technique, um, we're using B.F. Skinner's um, theory in that. He talked about law of, uh, uh, effect, law of effect. So a reinforcer, whatever follows a, a behavior, will make it likely or unlikely to occur again. And when they use a reinforcer, which is a pleasant consequence, uh, it is more likely to occur. He divided up your reinforcers into what he called intrinsic or primary or secondary reinforcers. He said intrinsic or primary reinforcers meet a biological need. So food meets a biological need. Praise is our self-esteem, right? It meets a basic biological need. However, uh, that's not the only reinforcers we can use. We know money is a huge reinforcer because it buys us food, drink, and other uh, things that will make us feel good. So these are the type of reinforcers that can be used. He um, developed his operant conditioning by using what he called the Skinner box, um, by giving food to these pigeons uh, whenever they, uh, ex they express the desired behavior. So in this case, he's showing them a color and he wants the pigeon to tap on the right color and he will, uh, the pigeon will get a treat for it. Your third and, um, theorist uh, is Albert Bandura. Uh, in order to succeed, people need a sense of self-efficacy to struggle together with, with resilience to meet the inevitable obstacle and adequacies of life. Self-efficacy is the belief you have about your abilities and how these abilities may um, affect one's outcome in life. Albert Bandura came up with social cognitive theory. One of his biggest contributions are the role of observational learning right here. I put a, um, video, on, a video about observational learning and aggression and his use of the Bobo doll, the Bobo doll experiment in helping us understand how children learn simply by observing others. Please make sure you um, also watch that video. So he said observational learning can be in one's attention or can be affected by one's attention, retention, initiation, motivation. We have this vicarious reinforcement where we're watching a model either be reinforced for a behavior or punished. Those of you that have siblings, you may have learned certain behaviors by watching your sibling either get punished by your um, parent and you say, oh my God, I'm not gonna do that because I don't wanna get punished or reinforced. So it increases the probability for you uh, to engage in that behavior. So quickly, which form of learning occurs when a voluntary response is strengthened by its association and consequences that occur soon after the response? So we're talking about consequences that would be operant conditioning. Which behavioral theory proposes that we learn new responses by observing others model that behavior? Social cognitive theory, which was by Albert Bandura. Then we have Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget was um, a theorist that was really interested in uh, our cognitive development. He believed that intelligence is what you use when you don't know what to do, your ability to manipulate new situations. Jean Piaget um, was the first to systematically study how children's thinking uh, differs as they grow older. Uh, really interesting uh, 
theory, and we're going to look at his theoretical stages from infancy until adolescence. These are his uh, four stages. Again, I'm not going to go far into it because we'll look at each stage as we look at each age span. These are um, key concepts from John Piaget, the idea of object permanence, that object continue to exist even when out of sight. We're going to talk about conservation, uh, which one's appearance may not uh, equate to amount. It'll make sense when we talk about uh, conservation and some of the tasks he did to measure conservation. We're going to talk about egocentrism, the inability to see others' perspective. And um, if he proposed a theory of mind and others came and really expanded on it, and we're going to talk about that when we look at early childhood. Unfortunately, Piaget did have his share of criticism. The um, critics of Piaget say development is not discontinuous like he believed. It is more continuous. Um, researchers have shown Piaget may have been off a little bit with his age, uh, age of certain tasks that are um, developed. Uh, Piaget's theories were based, again, on Western culture, so cross-cultural variations are not taken into account. And um, the fifth stage that he didn't really talk about, but others have uh, developed since. The last theorist is Lev Vygotsky. He believed cognition is formed through our social, cultural, and historical interaction with others. Children learn to think by interacting in an authentic everyday activity. So for Lev Vygotsky, cognitive development was much more social than what Piaget had given us. And again, we'll look at this a little bit more in depth. And that is it for um, this chapter. We will explore each of these theorists much more in depth as we go along. But if this is just a quick introduction into um, some of the major theorists.